today as they announced at the beginning there'll be a second collection, but I know you you had no warning, so um, the second collection is just for the uh, people affected by the tornadoes in Oklahoma. So um, if you're ready, fine. If you're not, and, but in the future you want to contribute, you can make put in an envelope whatever you want for them, marking it either Oklahoma or tornado. It will get to the right place. Today, as I said at the beginning, and as you all know, we celebrate the feast of the body and blood of Christ, Corpus Christi. And the readings, uh, as I said for the second reading from, uh, from 1 Corinthians, was probably written only about 20 years after uh, Jesus' death and resurrection. And he says, as you heard, Paul says, he says, I received from the Lord what I handed on to you. In other words, he had the teaching, and he gave them. And if you hear the way Paul tells it, Jesus on the night he was handed over, he took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body, do it in remembrance of me. And the same thing with the cup. The cup of the new covenant of my blood, do drink it in remembrance of me. For Paul, who was challenged by a very vibrant and yet uh, divisive community in Corinth, he sees, he'll, and in another place, he'll talk about unity that should come out in, in chapter 10, earlier. In this case, he's saying, he's, he wrote this letter because there were too many divisions in the community. And he's trying to re-root re, uh, them in the, in the fundamentals of the faith. That what the Lord did, what we do in remembrance, when we receive the body and blood, we're receiving from God the presence of Christ and the reminder of all who Jesus was. It's not simply memory, as we might recall an event in grade school. It is a representation, really, of God's offering. And it's done by God. Yes, the priest says the prayer. Yes, we all celebrate, but it is God who presents himself again. And the, the community for you can hear from the very earliest times understood that what Jesus did at that Last Supper was forever, was a gift for us that we might. But it, it roots us again in, in that offering. So when you and I receive, we receive the fullness of his love. You know, and the, and, the, and the reality of his offering. Now, Luke, uh, in the gospel that I read, talks about, uh, you know, there, there are all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, talk about the uh, feeding of 4,000, 5,000. In fact, Luke and Matthew tell of two feedings. So, uh, so there are six accounts of miraculous feeding. And for the early Christian community, it reflected to them an almost Eucharistic gift. It wasn't the Eucharist, because they are clear that that was at the Last Supper. But they used the same language as you hear it, right? He takes the loaves, he says the blessing, he breaks them, and he gives them. So they, the, any Christian hearing this gospel read would be immediately thinking of what they celebrate and what you and I celebrate 2,000 years later here on Sunday, the Eucharist. And what Luke wants us to draw, he says, I, I love the way he tells the story, not simply Luke, but Luke today. You know, the, the disciples are sensitive to the fact that this community of people that have been following Jesus, they've received the word of God, they've heard about the reign of God, they've been healed, but it's late, and they point this out to Jesus. And Jesus' response to them is, give them food yourselves. He puts it back, and of course, naturally they're stunned, because they have five loaves of fish, and they, would, would they go and buy it? And of course, then he goes on, and Jesus, after blessing and breaking, he feeds them. We can draw from, from this image and the image presented in Corinthians 
an invitation to us to take life more seriously, what we celebrate more seriously. It is true that we, like the Corinthians, who celebrate the Eucharist every week, might become used to the, the reality and the, the, the dailiness of it, uh, in a sense, loses its impact for us. Understandable, human beings are like that. But the invitation today is to say, let's, let's <clears throat> turn back and think. If God is giving you Jesus Christ, His body, His blood, that have everything about everything who He was today, which is true, then we're, we're invited to, to rethink, to remember, not as if a memory, but to reappropriate what God is offering us. And if we hear the gospel today, you feed them, we see the challenge that is presented to all of us to take and to, and to make the world a different place. In other words, it never reaches fruition until we, we ourselves take that precious gift and begin to give it. When I was young, oh, that was two or three years ago, <laughs> the, uh, the, there, was, uh, there was an era in, in the late 60s, I forget who it wrote, The Population Bomb. There was a book like that. Does anybody remember that book? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> At any rate, the effect of the book was this, that they, he said by the 1980s, there would be massive starvation. By, certainly by the 90s, there would be massive starvation if we didn't control the population immediately. Uh, and the effect was that often in the when I uh, in the early 70s when people would come to be married, they would say, I, I don't think we should have children. You know, I mean, you know, it's not the responsible thing to do. In other words, this author had convinced people that there would never be enough, and that the only responsible thing to do would be to to, to not have children or have less children because a bomb was going to explode. Of course, what happened was the Green Revolution and a different way of, of feeding. The invitation for us is not to be stunned at this, this uh, invitation to Jesus to feed them, but to accept it as a mission. Now, certainly physically we can do that, right? We can make a difference, not the biggest difference in the world, but there are ways to to step out the feet. We can live less so that others might have more. We can do that. It's within, it's within the power of every one of us here today. That certainly is true. But then also, Jesus wasn't only stopping physically. Clearly, Luke implies somewhat a Eucharistic vision. People are hungry for more than just food. People are hungry to have meaning in their life. People are hungry to find uh, the, the direction. They're, they're hungry to find forgiveness sometimes, and certainly they're hungry to find uh, love. And that's where you and I come in. Having first been loved by Christ, we need to be missionaries for that ourselves. Having been forgiven ourselves, we need to be instruments of this forgiveness. In other words, we need to feed people more, yes, physically, but even more deeply with our testimony. Uh, I, I challenge you today to go forth and give an element, element of testimony to someone about why you came to church today. I mean, I assume most of us didn't, you know, didn't come in to get out of the heat. <laughs> I suppose you could give that testimony. But when, why don't you, uh, if you get an opportunity, say, you know, I was, I was in church today, and boy, it touched my heart. Hopefully, it did. Uh, but and and a, a, an elevator testimony is what you can do in three minutes at the most, sharing your life um, with no uh, an invitation, maybe to say someone who says. I'd like to know more. You feed them, he says. Give them some food yourselves, Jesus says. 
yes, physically, but also let's let's be missionaries of this uh, of this message. Now, uh, I was talking to Clem this morning, Father Clem, and he said, and I might as well use it myself. He said, you know what? He said, after you receive communion, he says, you're not commissioned to the final blessing to go out. He said, so don't rush right out. <laughs> so I thought, well, that's a really, really invitation. So uh, I offer it to you. Uh, you know, uh, wait until the final commissioning and then go out and do it. <coughs> go out and give your testimony. Go out and begin to feed. Go out and change your 